Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Mu'min. Um, I'll be to, uh, your moderator today. Uh, I'm a team member here at HCI um, on the program team. Today we have Dr. Ben Thompson, uh, Dr. Yasser Khan, uh, Sister Tahar, uh, Sheikh Ahmed, who will be joining us to highlight um, some work that is being done by medical professionals and also humanitarian organizations on the ground in Gaza. Uh, of course, as we all know, Gaza is going through a very severe humanitarian crisis. Um, so we're hoping to highlight some of the challenge, challenges that medical professionals are facing uh, on the ground and uh, and how uh, humanitarian charities such as HCI are working to support uh, and alleviate um, the suffering. Um, so before we start, I'm just going to go over the agenda very briefly. Um, you know, uh, following my remarks, of course, we're, we're going to have a, a panel session with our two doctors, Dr. Ben and Dr. Yasser. Uh, we will we will be asking them a few questions to uh, you know gather their insights on what they've observed on the ground, what challenges they perceive, and uh, what advice they have to offer for uh, us Canadians who are here uh, at home. Um, following that, we will be going to Iftikhar, who will be highlighting uh, through a presentation uh, some work that HCI is doing on the ground. And following uh, that, we will be having a Q and A session uh, where you are able to ask questions to Dr. Yasser, Dr. Ben, and uh, Sister Iftikhar on any questions you have about the uh, the emergency. Uh, I know some of you have also submitted your questions through registration, so we do have those, and we will be uh, asking those as well. Um, you can you know, use the Q&A function uh, in, in Zoom to ask your questions. We prefer that. Uh, if you can't figure that out, then by all means, drop it in the comments uh, section as well, or the chat and uh, one of our team members will be uh, taking it from there as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. So perhaps Dr. Ben, we can start with you. Oh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to chat with you. Um, I'm, I'm Ben Thompson. I'm a Toronto-based internal medicine and kidney medicine physician. I've been actually fortunate enough to go to Gaza and West Bank since about 2013. I was there in September 2023, and then again um, in March 2024 for for a couple of weeks, and I was able to see a variety of the healthcare um, facilities that have been decimated in, in March. Um, so it's a ple pleasure to be with you today. And it's a pleasure to have you. Um, maybe Dr. Yasser will, will go to you next. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. I'm Yasser Khan. I'm uh, an ophthalmologist, eye surgeon, and I specialize in uh, eye and facial uh, reconstructive uh, plastic surgery. And I work in the uh, Mississauga, Brampton, Oakville area. And uh, I was um, fortunate enough to, uh, blessed enough uh, to go to Gaza um, in December, uh, which was, I think, the first North American mission that went. And I went again in March, um, all to Khan units in the European Gaza Hospital. And a bit of Rafa, too. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. And last but not least, uh, Iftikhar. Thank you, Mumin. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Iftikhar Sheikh Ahmed. I'm the Global Programs Director at Human Concern International. Um, I was lucky enough to go to Palestine three times in my life. So when I was 10 years old, because I'm uh, half Palestinian. So I visited uh, my dad's uh, hometown, that's in Jenin. And then I went twice uh, as an adult uh, with uh, HCI. Uh, back in December 2020 with Canadian delegation and um, last July uh, for our intervention uh, in Jenin Cap with UNORWA and also for uh, some work that we did in Jerusalem and uh, areas close to Ramallah. I was supposed to cross to Gaza on October 18th uh, just to uh, do a monitoring and evaluation visit and also to connect with our partners on the ground uh, to uh, develop new projects uh, and continue our work in uh, Gaza. Thank you. Um, so we'll get started with our first question for our panelists. Um, from your experience in Gaza, can you share any stories that have impacted you as a professional? And what physical and emotional toll does working in such a high pressure environment uh, have on, on professionals? So Brad, Dr. Ben, we can start off with you. Uh, sure. Thank you. I mean, I I should preface by saying I have a three-year-old daughter. And um, so 
when I see children killed, it is very personal. Um, and I don't think you actually need to have a daughter, though. The reality is what healthcare workers in Gaza are seeing, one only needs to have humanity to, to recognize the I mean, it's 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 beyond disgusting what's happening. But um, if I can recall one particular patient, I mean, I was in I was working in a primary care clinic in southern Gaza in Rafa, and a mother came in with her young child. The child was only about eighteen months old, obviously very malnourished. Um, that was immediately apparent. The child hadn't been eating for a couple of weeks. Um, and that was the reason the mother brought her into the clinic because the you know she she wasn't the the child wasn't eating. Um, after examining the young girl, we established that her liver, her spleen were both enlarged. We um, I did a physical exam. I could actually feel lymph nodes as well that were palpable. Um, in at that time, there was very, very limited, and there still is essentially very limited ability to do blood work. So the ability to investigate what was happening was extremely limited. What we did have suggested to me, probably this was a uh, primary cancer, a type of blood cancer like a lymphoma or leukemia. Now, recognizing I was in Gaza in March 2024 and not September 2023, there were some dramatic differences as far as what was available with health resources. So um, in Canada, I would have simply started by ordering an MRI or a CAT scan. But in, in Gaza in March 2024, of the three MRI scanners that existed in September, all three have been destroyed. Four of the five CT scanners had been destroyed. And the only one that was left was awaiting a part that needed permission of the Israelis to be allowed in. And it had been waiting for weeks for that part. And so it was, was essentially non-functional. So I couldn't image this young girl. Um, and as it turned out, you know, again, what would be the alternative step in September 2023 in Gaza? I would have simply done a biopsy um, and taken one of the lymph nodes, sent it to a lab to do pathology. Um, it would have been read by one of the two pathologists in Gaza who could read it and tell me what the diagnosis was. But the two pathology facilities in Gaza um, that would process that sample, both of them have been bombed by Israel uh, and destroyed. The two pathologists who would have read that sample have both been killed. Um, so there was no way to get a diagnosis. And unfortunately, um, you know, the next step is, of course, well, then she needs to leave Gaza. But, you know, I actually, I, I got I got the data this morning from the Ministry of Health officials in Gaza, and there's been over 25,000 requests for people in Gaza to leave for the purposes of getting treatment outside of Gaza. Of those, 6,645 have been approved. Um, only 4,850 have been able to leave Gaza. Um, but... Since the Rafa border has been bombed and destroyed, um, since that time, that was about that was June 24th. Since that time, only 219 people of the 25,000 applications have been able to leave Gaza for care, meaning almost certainly this young girl is dead. Um, and that's, I mean, we we talk about is this a genocide? Well, I mean, yes, it is. Every healthcare provider who's been to to Gaza um, from Canada agrees it is. Genocide scholars agree that it is. The ICJ has deemed it to be plausible. Um, so what we saw was evidence of that. And the 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 deliberate targeting and destruction of the healthcare system um, and a public health crisis. And that girl was particularly a good example of not being a victim of bombing, but being a victim of the genocide, just regardless. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, Dr. Yasser. Yeah, thanks. I'm just gonna know. Um, I mean, I was, I was, you know, um, I mean, where do you even start? And I, I mean, I will, I will preface that I, I went uh, with Ben in March, my second time. When I went my first time in December, between December and March, which was about two, two months, um, you know, uh, or three, two or three months. Um, I mean, things were much worse already in just three months, and this was like at, at about, um. Uh, five months after the genocide, I think at that point in time. And so now, I mean, things are, uh, you know, uh, 
Because yeah, because the genocide, the, the attacks and, and the indiscriminate bombing has only gotten worse. So it's much, much worse now than it was before. So everything everything we say is 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 at least a hundred factors or times worse than what we saw when we were there. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I obviously I, I agree with Ben. I mean, I've got a seven-year-old daughter and, and, and the one thing that really struck to me was, of course, um, you know, a, a, a six-year-old girl that I saw. But I mean, you know, but I mean, I, I think what struck to me and, and that really hit home because she was skinny, she'd lost weight and she had a huge rock uh, or shrapnel in her eyeball, which shattered her eyeball and had to remove her eye and this big shrapnel. And she was skinny. I, we went, this was in December. It was cold. Uh, They're living outside. So so she was wrapped in five, five layers of clothes, right? Uh, and we brought this skinny, uh, you know, malnourished girl, um, six years old, into the OR. Um, I don't know where her parents were, to be honest. So she was by herself. Usually in North America, parents accompany you at least to the door, right? So she's by herself among strangers, had this eye. And then we had to, uh, you know, it was all covered with dust and rubble. So we had to take each layer of clothing off, right? It was like five layers just to keep them warm. And she was just playing outside. Anyways, um, when I was there, 90% of the patients I saw were children, right? And I took, uh, because I'm an eye surgeon and eye trauma surgeon, I took, and also a facial surgeon, I took, um, you know, one, uh, you know, um, like about at least in one week alone, about 10 eyes out, uh, sometimes both eyes, rendering the patients uh, blind. And 90% were children, actually 95% were children that I saw when I was there. Um, so that's one thing. I mean, the, the extent of injury to children is 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 um is huge um and between january december january and march resources were less um and there wasn't really uh much much left so um so again now it's even worse uh with regards to medical equipment and disposables medications anything to do with trauma and surgery is in short supply doctors in short supply because a, a big problem now for the ngos to get us in is that the Israelis are in control now and they're restricting, uh, you know, doctors from getting in and people are rejected. I mean, uh, a, a, an NGO submits 25 people and only two or three get accepted. Sometimes they go right to the border through Jordan now. They get rejected at the border. And these doctors from North America have taken two, three, four weeks off. They've canceled their patients. They've made, they've rearranged their practices, which is not an easy thing to do. And you go there. So that's what the Israelis are doing intentionally because there's no good reason. Of course, people of Palestinian origin are not allowed. Um, that's that's one thing. And and I mean, I, I think I think the amount of so the other thing I'll finish off with, with which is also very, very important, um, is a mental trauma. When I went in March, I can only imagine what it is now. When I went in March, two months later, a few months later, the, the healthcare workers were burnt out, right? And so because the amount of mental trauma that they've suffered and they've worked through is immense. Forget the patients. Of course, the victims are also severely affected, but so are the healthcare workers. Um, and so those are big, big concerns that I think that we have to really kind of acknowledge and kind of address basically as we go forward. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. And you've kind of um, touched on a little bit of, of what our next question is going to be, and that is, you know, what are some of the most pressing challenges on the ground currently? Now, you mentioned between when you went there in December and, and, and then March, there was a big difference. Um, what have you been hearing from the ground, from perhaps, you know, your colleagues or from the news or from those that you know that are in Gaza right now? What are you hearing from them in terms of uh, some challenges that are now present or will be present uh, in the next few months uh, compared to when you were there in March? Uh, Dr. Yasser, over to you. I mean, first of all, I will say the violence is getting worse. Um, when 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 Iran when Iran, Iran did their missile attack on Tuesday, um, the uh, Israeli occupation forces took it out on on the Palestinians, and they went in and they went to Khan Yunus uh, with tanks without without any evacuation orders. At surprise, and just started uh, started shooting with their tanks and whatever. Uh, one of my um, uh, people I work very closely, she was a hospital journalist uh, photographer. She just texted me uh, yesterday that that her sister and her and her brother in law were affected. Her brother in law died basically. They were just sleeping in their tents, and the Israelis just started shooting randomly. 
So I think ongoing violence is a big thing. Um, again, uh, shortage, uh, you know, shortage of, of, of healthcare facility, there's constant evacuations. And, and, and this goes on on a daily basis, constant evacuations and constant reconstructing of hospitals. I mean, it, the Palestinian healthcare workers, and Ben will tell you, are extremely resourceful and very innovative. They can do amazing things with nothing. I mean, it shows the innovation of them. But I mean, you know, there's gauze, uh, surgical instruments, um, damage from moving from one hospital from Nasser to European back to the European Gaza hospital uh, to Al-Aqsa, then out, that damages equipment. So there is a really a, a, a problem with, with gauze and equipment and sutures and, and medications and supplies and getting them in. Okay, so that's the um, the other challenge is, of course, healthcare workers. Um, you know, they're still going strong, but there's a shortage of nurses, obviously mental health workers and doctors and surgeons. And the Israelis are severely restricting people from outside coming in um, in any way that they can, whether it's a four week time limit versus two weeks, whether it's just anybody with Palestinian origin can't come in for, for whatever reason. It's arbitrary. Right. So that's a huge, huge um, stress on the system. Right. Um, and with ongoing trauma. Right. So it's not stop. And not only that, and, and Ben will attest to that because there's there's the acute trauma. Then there's the chronic trauma dealing with. Uh, and and also there is the, uh, you know, there is the, um, uh, you know, the non-communicable disease or NCDs, as we call them, everything else that's going on that's not been sorted, like all the other healthcare problems as well. So it's a it's a disaster um, and it's not improving. It's only getting worse. Thank you. So, I mean, you know, you, you said shortage of facilities, uh, shortage of supplies, uh, of course, shortage of, of medical professionals. Dr. Ben, I mean, over to you. Is there anything that you want to add to, to that answer? Yeah, I mean, I think I break this down into two components. There's the damage that's specifically to the healthcare system. And what we traditionally think of a healthcare system as far as the hospitals, the healthcare supplies, the hospital workers... And then there's the stuff outside hospital, which I don't think we should we should underestimate. So within the hospital, the traditional healthcare system that we think of with the, the building and people, 24 of the 36 hospitals from September 2023 have been completely destroyed. Of the 12 that remain, only three of them are actually fully um, you know, full comprehensive service hospitals. So the remainder are very small hospitals. You know, you might have an eye hospital or you might have, you know, a rehab hospital or something that really was not designed to, pro to provide full, full spectrum of services. Um, there's been now, as of today, 986 healthcare workers killed, many of whom were the health, you know, the heads of departments, the, the heads of their universities, the um, you know, the Omar Farwana, well, well known to be one of the first who was the head of obstetric, sorry, was well, his wife was one of the heads of obstetrics. The head of obstetrics in the Indonesian hospital has been killed. The head of nephrology has been killed. The head of internal medicine has been killed. These, I mean, it's not just the volume of people killed, but the significance of those people, not just to the day-to-day -day clinical care of people in Gaza, but also the future of teaching future medical leaders in Gaza. Um, I talked about some of the equipment that's been destroyed. Um, and, and yes, like MRI machines, CAT scans, but also a lot of the things we don't even notice in hospitals, like infusion pumps, um, you know, machines to organize medication distribution, these sorts of things that we just take for granted, they've been destroyed, right? Um, critical shortages in medications. Typically in September, it wasn't uncommon for the United Nations essential medication list that was typically 30 to 40 percent of those, even in September 2023, were in um, in short supply or not available in Gaza. Now that number is closer to 60 percent um, of the injuries. So, we, you know, yes, there's been about 42,000 martyrs or, or people killed. There's now been um, almost 100,000 injuries, thousands of which are complex injuries in a healthcare environment that is does not have the infrastructure to do multiple surgeries. Many of these are complex orthopedic and burn injuries, which require two, three, even more numbers of surgeries. That's simply not available. Um, you know, Dr. Khan mentioned the staff has not been paid since October. They're overworked, they're traumatized. Uh, many of their own family members have been killed. They themselves have been displaced many times and are predominantly now living in tents. 
Um, which brings me to the outside the hospital health crisis, which is, you know, mass displacement. The overwhelming majority of people are not living in their homes. The homes that they live in are predominantly tents um, because of the targeting of water, electricity, sewage. Um, 95 percent of people have no access to clean water. And of those who, who do have access to water, uh, it's not clean. And the amount of water is less than 10% of the standard considered minimum for uh, water availability in a humanitarian emergency. Um, that lack of water, the raw sewage actually entering people's homes, the lack of electricity has contributed to a massive number of infectious diseases. So over 2.1 million infectious diseases have now been reported. That includes hepatitis A, skin and respiratory infections, diarrhea, and of course, we all notice now polio. Um, so when we think of um, the reconstruction efforts, really, I would frame it among inside hospitals, outside hospitals. We have experience rebuilding after the, the extensive bombing campaigns from 2012, 2018, 2015, uh, where hospitals and healthcare facilities have been targeted in the past, and those can be reconstructed. What's going to be much more difficult in this humanitarian crisis is that the mosques, the churches, the schools, the housing infrastructure, the water lines, the sewage line, the electricity, all of that has also been decimated. And so when we think of uh, health, those things are also really important. Um, so the, the reconstruction efforts are going to be massive. It's not going to be in the order of one to two years. We're talking decades. We're not talking millions. We're talking billions and potentially trillions of reconstruction dollars. I uh, thank you for that, Dr. Ben. And, you know, I, I think some of the common things that I've picked up from both of your answers, uh, of course, is um, the lack of uh, critical equipment. So we're talking about you know MRI machines, CT scans, etc., that are basically non-existent, um, and of course you know equipment that is uh, that is generally taken for granted by medical professionals is you know no longer there either, uh, and you know of course water disease um, and and of course you know very severe and critical injuries that are uh, that are not able to be treated fully as they would be in, in a fully functioning uh, environment, and of course the lack of overall infrastructure in terms of the hospitals and clinics available uh, to the people in Gaza. Um, you know, I think uh, this this really brings me to my next question, which is, you know, um, of course, you know, there's there's efforts happening in two ways. You have doctors such as yourselves who are going on medical missions, uh, but you also have um, humanitarian workers that are there um, providing aid through, you know, lots of different Canadian charities. So from your experience in, in being in Gaza, um, you know, what have you observed from Canadian charities in terms of the work that they're doing on the ground to provide some relief to um, the shortage in medical supplies, the shortage in medicine, to, you know, to water, to, to food and shelter and, and even mental health? Like, what are you seeing on the ground that is helping from Canadian charities? Uh, maybe, Dr. Ben, we can start with you first. Yeah, and, and you know, I think this is a very important question to be asking now because um, really the efforts in Gaza up to this point have predominantly been focused on humanitarian action, um, which is, you know, emergency medical teams, provision of emergency supplies of water, food um, to combat the famine that's now affecting about 2.1 million uh, people in Gaza. Um, and so, I think, I mean, that's important work to do, but what we need to really shift our focus on is not only to continue the humanitarian action, but look to the future of what's going to be needed a year from now, five years from now, to build a sustainable future for people in Gaza. And I think there's really two components of that. Obviously, development is a huge component of that. And so organizations like Human Concern International are really important. So um, I think the project, I'm, I'm especially impressed by the project to support medical students to complete their studies, especially in the context of the two medical schools in Gaza, Al-Azhar University and Islamic University of Gaza. Both of them have been destroyed. Um, the medical students' studies has been severely disruptive, or sorry, disrupted um, due to a combination of displacement, the lack of 
um, ability of their parents to finance their ongoing education, the inability to access food, the inability to access water, safe shelter. Many of their um, uh, classmates, every single class, every single medical student class has had students killed, right? So the students themselves are, you know, um, traumatized. So to, to have the added challenge of having their own future, you know, confronted and saying, you might not actually be able to finish and ever live your dreams of becoming a physician and the impact that has on a society that um, wants to build a healthcare system, you know, by Palestinians, for Palestinians, it's huge. And so being able to support these, these, um, these students to finish their studies and to become the the physicians they want to be, I think is really important. And that that I would say that's actually one of the more important projects that's ongoing that that Human Concern International is doing. Now, at some point, and I say this, um, I'm I'm hopeful. Um, I'm also realistic given the political affiliations. That at some point, my expectation and hope would be that given the volume of donation, the massive amounts of reconstruction that need to happen on the development sector, Global Affairs Canada and USAID need to be involved. Um, they need to commit funding. And I'm not talking about a million dollars. I'm talking about billions of dollars. Um, there are additional groups that will be part of this effort. Traditionally, you know, Islamic Relief, IDRF, Oxfam, ANERA, Save the Children, These all these organizations have traditionally been involved in development efforts. I should note, though, like there is an elephant in this room, and I think it needs to be explicitly stated. You know, um, we all observed during the polio vaccination rollout that many, you know, the United Nations, UNICEF, um, as well as some other humanitarian actors repeatedly said, like, you're going to vaccinate children and literally on their walk back from being vaccinated to their homes, they're going to be bombed and killed. That's grotesque. Right. And and we demanded a ceasefire, not a not a pause for the sake of vaccination. Many of these people have to walk for hours to get to the vaccination site and then they get vaccinated and they walk back during a period of time when that that uh, ceasefire is no longer in effect. I mean, it's grotesque. Many of the kids, because it's a two vaccination protocol, they have to get two doses one month apart. Many of the kids will be killed in that month. Right. And I think it, it just it's. To me, it's grotesque that um, this has been going on as long as it has. And it brings that third piece to this, which is um, the humanitarian and development sectors need to be critically involved. That's that's no one. No one debates that. No one underestimates the massive impact they have to have. But this has to happen in the context of peace. This has to. And when I say peace, I don't mean the absence of violence. That's not the type of peace we need. We need like a mutual understanding where there's a prolonged um, peace where people in Palestine and Israel can live in peace. People in Israel, peace. People in, in Gaza and West Bank, peace. Uh, but also where people in Palestine have a sustained um, self-determination where they have a right to make their own decisions about their own health and their own health sector and their own recovery. Um, and that can't happen in the context of an illegal occupation. It can't happen in the context of apartheid. It can't happen in the context of genocide. Um, so I think that third piece of, you know, uh, anchored, I think, in international humanitarian law and the International Court of Justice decisions are, are critical in this. That also needs to be a critical role because without it, the development and humanitarian actions are not going to be as effective. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Um, Dr. Yasser. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll just add to, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, add to what 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 Ben has said. Um, I, I think that uh, with regards to, um, you know, uh, Canadian NGOs uh, being on the ground and, and I mean, listen, I mean, I think that um, I think uh, as uh, as for many things in the world, um, you know, between October 6th and October 7th, it, it's a, it's a different world uh, for every for everybody. Uh, you know, um, whether it's here locally for us living day to day as as, as Canadians and, and in our workplaces as physicians, uh, but also NGOs. So I think the world has changed for the NGOs. And I think that that all the Canadian NGOs I mean, the ones that Ben mentioned, um, you know, and your and HCI, I mean, uh, they're there. I mean, the time for competition is over. There has to be better coordination uh, and there has to be a, a coordination. And then 
and then and, and then a lot of um uh, a lot of work with global affairs canada um and or 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 the um the department responsible for 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 international development and the and and with the minister um you know and 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 that has to start now because uh, i don't know i mean i uh, listen i mean uh, i it's probably already going on so uh, i apologize if 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 uh, i'm speaking out of line but it has to start asap because you have to establish uh connections and relationships with with the bureaucracy right now because there'll be a new government coming next year and the new government may not be so friendly right uh it may not be so aligned uh, I mean, already we've had trouble with the current government regards to the genocide, regards to calling a ceasefire, which took for which took forever. Um, and so you don't know what the new government's going to be like. So it's important to maintain relationship with with, with bureaucracy because I think only together uh, uh, um, can we really. Because thing is, uh, yes, ICJ ruling. This is not going to end soon. It's not. I mean, let's just. Uh, I mean, the kind of peace that Ben's talking about is not going to happen soon. I mean, it's just not, not with this current Israeli government, not with what they're doing. Uh, they're going to have to be forced to stop either through violence or through severe diplomatic pressure, which I hope is the case because it's that's better for everybody, right? But so it's not going to end soon. So what do we do until? Like, how do we get in? Because that's a big issue. How do we get in and, and how do we coordinate? And for that, I, get, I agree. For that, the NGOs are going to have to work in, in unison with the government. With, with with the Canadian government to get these things in and force it in despite the ongoing uh genocide and war which is which is going and which is not going to stop for at least a year or maybe more than a year depending on what happens it can change any time but that's that's what the tra current trajectory is I think in my opinion so just to maybe summarize you know of course we want to build solutions that are sustainable but you know equally if not more important right now is advocacy. And, and, you know, for lack of a better word, lobbying the government to, um, you know, create better channels for aid, to apply to, uh, you know, diplomatic pressure to, um, you know, uh, create prolonged periods of peace so that relief can occur uh, in a sustainable manner. Um, I know members of the ACI team today were on Parliament Hill speaking to politicians, and I know many other charities also have been partaking in those conversations over the last year, and I hope uh, inshallah, God willing, that that work continues uh, because I I agree that is uh, it's equally uh, far more important than than the traditional role that NGOs play. Um, just a reminder before you go on to the last question, um, you know we will be taking yes. questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, just uh, and what are your interactions with the bureaucracy? Because politicians come and go, ministers come and go, MPs come and go, but the bureaucrats stay there. The assistant, you know, the assistant director, the assistant deputy. Uh, you know, and and so that those are people that you need to kind of make strong relationships with. I'm sure you are, but anyways. No, well, thank you for that. I know Mahmoud is in the in the audience, and uh, some members from our GR team are here as well. And we'll definitely, you know, we're taking that advice and we're listening. Um, so on to the last question. Um, and you know, I think, of course, me, I've I've never been to Gaza. I've never had the privilege. Um, and so hearing these stories firsthand is obviously very impactful. Of course, you see things on social media, you see videos, photos, but hearing it from people who have been there uh, and their personal accounts, uh, that makes things really real. I mean, at least it has made things very real for me. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of people complain of burnout in terms of uh, advocacy, in, in terms of giving donations, uh, you know, in terms of the mental toll that this has on people just from seeing, reading the news, reading posts on social media. So a question for both of you, and perhaps Dr. Yasser, we can start with you on this one. Um, what advice do you have for Canadians um, to maintain their resilience and long-term commitment to rebuilding Gaza? Well, I think, I think uh, you know, uh, uh, for, first and foremost, um, I, I do feel, and, and I'll say this first, is, uh, is uh, to be a little selfish. Because you have to take care of yourself and your mental health. Um, you know, there's doom scrolling uh, uh, is is very hazardous to your health. Um, and, we're, and we're all victim of that these days. I am as well, and I'm sure Ben is as well. And all this negative news um, really affects you. So I, I think I think I think that we as Canadians, as healthcare practitioners, we're much more valuable to the cause because this is a long game uh, to advocating uh, to peace, to ending this genocide, 
this killing and slaughter uh, in Gaza and Lebanon now. Uh, and any, you know, we're, we're much better when we're when we're healthy, right? Both mentally and physically. So I really encourage people to kind of focus on yourself. Uh, take, uh, you know, take the appropriate breaks. Use um, use your scrolling and your exposure to everything that's going on in a productive way, right? Not just kind of scrolling without any objective, any purpose. You know, use it to gain knowledge to see what's going on. Uh, to not forget to advocate further for what's going on. You know, you see the explosion here, uh, rather than just get down and say, oh my God, uh, you know, a, a, at least a hundred people have died. Lebanon's getting, South Beirut is getting destroyed just like Gaza was. What am I going to do? Instead of getting down, use it to advocate. Okay, okay. So now what do I, instead of what am I going to do? Oh no. Say, what do I have to do? Right? What do I have to do? Who can I work with? There's HCI, there's another organization uh, who can I kind of talk to? And that's where you have to be present to engage these people. Uh, otherwise, you get lost in the spiral of going nowhere and just getting down and down. And all this negative energy is going to, uh, and has already affected a lot of us, right? In the healthcare field, but also outside where you feel helpless. Well, we're not so helpless. There are things that we can do. Working with organizations like, like HCI, for example, is one thing we can do. What Ben and I are doing are, uh, by talking to people here is another thing we can do, right? Um, so that's my um, advice is that we have to be resilient in this because, you know, they've gone through a year of genocide now and they're, and they're still surviving um, and they're still fighting to survive, right? If they can take what they're going through, then I think for us, um, you know, that, that should be motivation for us to keep on going. But you have to look after yourself. And I really emphasize that to people. And whatever resources you have, there are resources. Sorry, uh, there, there are resources. There's mental health resources. There is um, support groups. Uh, engage, uh, engage them. And uh, we all need to be together in this. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. Uh, Dr. Ben. I, I actually really like this question. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I think it's a very important question. And um, I think back to October. Um, October 13th, I, I was suspended from my job. Um, myself and my family received death threats. Um, when I returned to my work, it was a immediately hostile environment. And all during that period of time, I had multiple good friends, I would even say loved ones in Gaza who were killed. Um, going from the very first physician I even met to good friends who I had developed programs with in Gaza killed. And I had some dark days. I had some terrible days. Some of the worst days of my life have been in the last year. And yet my worst day is still significantly better than the best day of anyone in Gaza for the last year. Um, so I think, I think about that. And then I, I ask myself as well, okay. I, I mean, I, I think, I think Dr. Khan said something that's really important, right? It's very easy to get overwhelmed or feel like we're drowning with negative news, right? Whether that's on social media, whether that's turning on the television and that can be paralyzing that can actually say, oh my Lord, I don't know what to do. I should do nothing. And yet the opposite is exactly what should happen, right? Um, I think about, you know, whether you're an institution, whether you're a politician, whether you're a humanitarian, whether you're a citizen, whoever you are, whatever you are, you probably at some point in your life said, I'm never going to do this unless this happens, something, right? Like I'm never going to go to a protest. I'm never going to write a letter to an MP. I'm never going to meet with an MP. I'm never going to go to Gaza to provide medical aid. I'm never going to like, whatever it is that you feel your red line is, right? Like, I'm never going to do that unless this happens. I would say that genocide, it should be well beyond any red line that anyone has. So I would argue that if there ever was a time period in your life when you needed to be active, and you needed to use whatever skills it, it, you have to make the lives of your brothers, sisters in Palestine better, now's that time. Because if you're not going to do it now, you're never going to do it, right? Um, so typically what I do, and I, I, I've definitely 
fallen for exactly what Dr. Khan said. Like I'll, I'll read the news and go, this is horrible. I feel like I'm, I'm incapable of doing anything. And, and I've sort of asked myself a question. Uh, I try to ask myself this question every day, which is like, what can I do today to advocate for Gaza? Right. And I have to ask myself that often before I even turn on the TV, right? So that I can frame it in, okay, this is happening. What skills do I have? What knowledge do I have that I can actually make a change, however small that is, to improve the situation for our brothers and sisters in Gaza? And I think like that's the mentality I've had. But I must admit, you know, Dr. Khan's 100% right. There's been days where it's been impossible for me to do that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ben and, and Dr. Asher as well um, for that advice. Something that I, I know that myself personally definitely need to hear. And really to summarize, you know, obviously self-care is, is priority. Um, you can't help others if you're not taking care of first. And Dr. Ben, what you said, now or never, right? Um, what can, you know, we do today? Uh, and asking that question to ourselves every day um, in order to, to make small incremental changes. Um, and in fact, so thank you both um, for your time. Um, we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is uh, Sister Iftikhar uh, in her presentation on how HCI is responding to the uh, the crisis. Um, our doctors will be online. Um, they'll be in the background and they'll be here for the question and answer period um, following Sister Iftikhar's presentation. So hold on to your questions. I know there's lots of questions coming in in the Q&A and the, and the chat. And I think we also have some questions coming in from social media. Uh, so bear with us. Uh, we'll definitely get to those very soon. Um, Iftikhar, over to you. Thank you, Mu'min. Uh, again, salam alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining our uh, webinar. So I will just go quickly on um, our history working in Palestine. So uh, HCI has been working in Palestine for the last two decades in West Bank, Jerusalem, and Gaza. Since we are talking about Gaza, I'm just going to focus a little bit on the work that we did in the past. And then I will move into what have we, what have we been doing since October 7th. So um, in the past, we uh, uh, partnered uh, with uh, UNORWA. As we all know, UNORWA is the lifeborn of the Palestinian refugees. And uh, they actually serve more than 70% of the population in Gaza. So we did with them rehabilitation of um, a Noor uh, uh, school that is for the visually impaired children. Unfortunately, that establishment has been bombed and uh, destroyed. We also worked with them in some uh, with uh, the Ministry of Health and renovation of some of the uh, com a medical complex there, such as uh, Shifa uh, Hospital. We were about to uh, rehabilitate the uh, Kamal Udwan uh, Maternity uh, Hospital. We did in the past establish and build a water well in uh, Al Musaddar village, which is uh, further to the north of uh, Gaza. Um, rehabilitated, uh, rehabilitated, sorry, uh, uh, the washrooms in the Onorwa schools and also uh, provided access to clean water to the communities uh, around these, uh, these schools. We did education programs through supporting the initiatives of uh, the Onorwa and we focused on uh, advancing the education of the orphans. So that's through our uh, child sponsorship program where we provided the families with financial support and uh, different uh, services just to make sure that the kids, they uh, attend schools and uh, their families don't have to worry about uh, uh, supporting or um, securing their, uh, their needs. And uh, through, you know, uh, this time while working in Gaza, many uh, attacks happened. So whenever that happened, we uh, worked on providing a subsidized um, uh, financial support for the families to rent new units while we renovate uh, theirs or uh, we contribute to rebuilding uh, these uh, units whenever possible. We did also in Gaza our uh, seasonal projects, which is Ramadan, Qurbani, and uh, the winter uh, relief one. So that's in brief what we uh, 
we had done in the past in Gaza. Now, uh, when October 7th happened, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, um, we were supposed to uh, cross to uh, Gaza on October 18th. And that's to evaluate the work that we have been doing in Gaza and also to uh, meet with our partners and uh, seek new venues for uh, improvement and uh, developing the Gaza Strip. Unfortunately, that did not happen because of the war. So um, because we have ongoing projects in Gaza, we were able from day one to deploy our partners and actually use the funds that was available uh, in the bank accounts of our partners to start the emergency relief. So we started with the... Um, the traditional uh, rapid response. So that's by providing uh, uh, relief uh, food packs, uh, NFIs, which is non-food items, and that includes the shelter items such as blankets, uh, mattresses, pillows, uh, clothes for uh, the families. And also we continued supporting the health sector through provide the provision of uh, fuel and the medical supplies. Uh, we were successful to uh, get trucks into Gaza. So in total, we got 11 trucks, which is not a big number. But we also were procuring locally all the time from Gaza because of the relationship that we have developed through the years with the suppliers uh, within within Gaza. So um, that's in in uh, in a brief, you know what uh, what we did when. October 7th uh, happened. Now, you know, similar to uh, uh, the previous uh, wars, we thought that was going to, you know, last for one month or two. But unfortunately, we are close to the one year mark. Um, after the uh, the 40th day of uh, of the, the war, that's where, you know, they... Um, uh, evacuated people from a Shifa hospital. So that's where we uh, we are looking into shifting our uh, intervention. And um, we expanded our operations. And by that, we also uh, added new uh, strategic partnerships to our list to for us to be able to leverage, you know, all the available uh, sources and venues to get the aid into Gaza and keep on with uh, the provision of uh, the emergency response. Uh, Ahmed, if you can just um, share the presentation, please, from your end. Thank you. So uh, I'm just going to go over uh, our uh, health interventions in Gaza, since, you know, we have uh, we are focusing on this. So um, the, our work is not only in Gaza, so we are working within Gaza and also we are extending support to uh, evacuees that are in Egypt and Turkey and also here at home in Canada. So the first one, we are talking about the medical housing and livelihood support a project for medical evacuees of the Gaza war in Turkey and in Egypt. So this is particularly focusing on the evacuee injured children, where we are providing around 400 children in both Egypt and Turkey with optimized medical recovery. So as we all know, when these children were were eva uh, evacuated to uh, the two countries, uh, they were admitted at the public uh, health uh, hospitals. And in Egypt in particular, I did two visits. Uh, the health system itself, you know, in Egypt is uh, crippled. Uh, you know, uh, they don't have much to do for the patient. So whenever the patient uh, situation or case is stabilized, that's the maximum that they can do. So through our program that we have there, we are moving the children from the public hospital. So that requires the consent of the parents. And because of that, the parents are, or the guardians and the companions are not uh, uh, anymore welcome to stay at the hospitals because there is nothing to do more for them. So that's why we decided that we are gonna uh, be renting um, furnish uh, apartments for the families and then the children will be seen by doctors from private hospitals and we develop a medical treatment plan for each of the cases so as per this, uh, the data that we have we have 400 children in both countries egypt and turkey in egypt we are housing 365 uh, families 
and uh, we are providing them with uh, monthly uh, cash uh, assistance so that they can actually uh, purchase whatever you know they need not based on our assumption that this is the need we are also providing the children with non-formal education so that there is not much interruption in their education and we have established in both countries psychosocial uh, support centers where we are providing the guardians and the children with um, with the mental health services and uh, psychosocial support the next uh, project that uh, we have in Gaza is the mat maternity health services, and that's through the rehabilitation of the maternity ward at Al Auda Hospital. So the, we were thinking actually of starting our own uh, maternity uh, center, but due to the destruction of most of the buildings in Gaza, it's hard to find one. And we believe in you know, joining forces and partnership. So the maternity ward at Al Auda Hospital was badly uh, affected and uh, destructed. So the decision was that we will rehabilitate that center and actually uh, support the work of Al Auda Hospital because they already have the staff. Now, in order for uh, for us to enhance the capacity of uh, of that maternity ward, we. Um, provided uh, a training for uh, for the medical staff and uh, among that is the one that actually you know either were in their uh, last year uh, and about to graduate or you know uh, community members that had a background in the medical sector and were willing to uh, to support the work also um, uh, we are uh, partnering with the ministry of health and onorwa for seamless coordination and uh, resource uh, reallocation since the onorwa uh, facilities were affected so they have been shifting and moving their staff wherever uh, it's possible uh, toward the other facilities that are partially functioning because there is no facility that is 100% uh, uh, functioning. And we are also uh, conducting uh, awareness campaigns and outreach programs to educate pregnant women and their families about available uh, services. The next one is the strengthening of dialysis services and capacity in Gaza uh, in, in, the, in the stripe. So as we know, uh, the the center that was providing the uh, services was destroyed. And this is in partnership with USSM Canada. Uh, we have granted them uh, a grant to purchase uh, and supply the dialysis machines for Nasser Medical uh, Complex in Gaza. And uh, the unit there, it's called Hindagma uh, Kidney Dialysis uh, Center. We also purchased and supplied a water uh, desalination uh, unit. Now, in coordination with the administration of uh, Nasser Medical Complex and rele uh, relevant authorities, uh, we are providing the necessary materials for the treatment of approximately 1,000 kidney failure patients. So each of them will be receiving three uh, treatments per week, and that's going to total to around two uh, 12,000 treatments uh, per month. The number, just gonna, you know, touch on that. The numbers that you are gonna hearing me, you know, um, stating, they are not large numbers, but that's us doing the work. There are other organizations there that are, you know, doing their part as well. So um, my message here is that we need really to join our forces and we need to work together as a community towards uh, enhancing the uh, health sector in Gaza and also looking into the other areas where uh, the emergency intervention is uh, needed. So, uh, you know, I will pass into how we are actually uh, improving the um, health sector in, uh, in Gaza. We uh, also procured a generator for El Kuwaiti Diagnostic uh, Center. Um, their uh, generator uh, like died, <laughs> that's the, the expression that they used, and uh, they were looking for a new one. So as you all know, uh, there is a huge list of uh, black, uh, the blacklist of the items that cannot enter Gaza. 
uh, even prior to October 7th. And among these are the spare parts for uh, such uh, equipments and the equipment itself. So uh, our partners were uh, able to secure that generator from a private owner where his business was um, was bombed and destroyed. So he was able to save whatever uh, machineries uh, and why not from the location. And that generator was one of it. So grass to that uh, intervention from our end, the Kuwaiti uh, Diagnostic Center now is, is um, able to receive cases and is uh, functional. Our uh, biggest intervention in uh, in Gaza is our uh, primary health care that we established uh, from the beginning of January of this year in uh, Tal Sultan neighborhood in the city of Rafah. And uh, the idea was to uh, provide uh, primary health services and emergency health services. And that covers also pediatric, OBG, and we were conducting minor surgeries. We had 15 beds, so we were also uh, admitting some of the cases uh, into our uh, facility. Unfortunately, when the ground invasion uh, took place, uh, that, that area of Tal Sultan in Rafah was still uh, a safe zone. But uh, then, you know, they had to evacuate for two days because there were uh, warnings to buildings around uh, the facility where uh, the people were asked to actually uh, evacuate because uh, their houses were going to be targeted. So uh, we moved after that, we reallocated, sorry, the clinic uh, to Mawasi Rafah where that area by you know uh, the definition of the IOF was a safe zone until they started bombing the tents around uh, that area our team uh, or the partners you know uh, they kept going providing services uh, with limitation and recently it became very difficult for them even to reach the center so alhamdulillah we were able to uh, secure uh, uh, a new uh, location in Deir al-Balah, and uh, the team has reallocated the clinic there. Just to mention that Dr. Ben and Dr. Yasser Khan, when they were in Gaza, alhamdulillah, they were able to visit the clinic when it was located in, in, uh, in the city of Rafah. I'm just going to touch uh, quickly because my colleagues are reminding me uh, regarding our um, scholarship program that we are having with the Islamic University of Gaza for the uh, Gaza medical students. So our intervention not only touches on uh, delivering and uh, addressing the uh, immediate and urgent needs, we are thinking you know, further for the day after the war. How are we going to be ready to uh, to have the infrastructure, you know, uh, the ground for uh, uh, for a sustainable approach. So as Dr. Ben mentioned regarding the students, we have two uh, universities in Gaza that have medical school there, the Islamic, uh, Gaza Islamic University and Al-Azhar University. So, uh, so far we have been working with the Islamic uh, University of Gaza where we are providing uh, financial assistance to uh, 361 students. And the students are uh, being trained in different uh, centers uh, that are you know, stretched all over the Gaza Strip. Also, we are providing the financial assistance to 15 faculty members. The idea is that through this intervention, we are rebuilding the uh, health sector of uh, in Gaza because these students, once they graduate, they are going to become the doctors that are, uh, are going to do the heavy lifting after the war comes to an end. We are also uh, discussing with Al-Azhar University to expand the same services to uh, their students uh, there. So that's in brief what we are doing in Gaza. I just wanted to touch on one important part, because we keep receiving this question from our donors, from, you know, uh, community uh, leaders and members, how we can support. We are in Canada. We have a voice. We are privileged. So one thing if I want to, you know, leave you with is that you use your voice 
advocate. Do not uh, underestimate you know, uh, participating in the protest, uh, signing the petitions. HCI has been since day one advocating for uh, immediate ceasefire, for the uh, securing, you know, humanitarian corridors where we can actually have a safe, secure path to get the aid in, inside Gaza. We have been advocating for uh, creating a safe space for the uh, medical uh, professionals and also uh, you know, advocating for uh, the well-being of the children because this war actually has killed children more than any war that, you know, as, as mankind we have witnessed. Uh, Momen, I hope I did not go over uh, the time. Uh, thank you so much. That was my part. Thank you, Vithakhar. That was right on time. So amazing. Uh, we have lots of questions coming in. Um, Dr. Ben and Dr. Yasser, are you, are you ready to take some questions? Happy to, yep. Yeah. yeah, amazing. I, I see, Dr. Ben, you've already started answering some in the in the Q and A, so that's amazing. Perhaps we can just go over them very quickly, just for the benefit of those who haven't seen the answers. Um, so, first question: Are doctors allowed to carry medicine or medical equipment into Gaza? Um, I can't. I can't turn. I can't turn my video on. By the way. Oh, that, that's okay. Um, we still hear you. So go go ahead. Oh, there you are. Uh, so are doctors allowed to carry medicine or medical equipment into Gaza? Um, Dr. Ben or Dr. Yasser, anybody want to take that? Yeah, so the, the restrictions around this have changed significantly um, over, over even last several months. So the emergency medical teams of physicians, nurses, or other healthcare providers who go in, uh, when Dr. Khan and myself went in March, even though the amount of aid that those teams can bring in, bring in is tiny compared to what's needed, um, we were permitted to bring, you know, two, three, some people even four suitcases, traditionally filled with, you know, women's hygiene products, diapers, some medications, blankets for, you know, shoes for kids, um, items that that um, would be would be given. And then often the suitcase was left there because of the mass displacement. People often wanted the suitcase as something convenient to carry when they were inevitably going to be displaced uh, to the next location. So um, so there was, you know, when it was going through Rafa, it was a little bit easier to get some stuff in, although, you know, compared to what was needed, the EMTs, so the emergency medical teams are an infinitesimally small fraction of what's actually needed, even if they were able to bring as much as they wanted. Um, when the Rafa border was destroyed, everyone now, when they come in to Gaza, they initially go to Amman in Jordan, and then they go south and they enter in a border that, that you know, through Israel, Karam Shalom, which um, severely restricts the what you're allowed to bring in. So for example, they now allow you to bring in one phone per person, which is actually kind of hard as a humanitarian. Many humanitarians actually carry two to overcome a lot of the reception challenges um, associated with travel. Um, they're only allowed to carry one. You're only allowed to have one suitcase, uh, which is extensively searched by Israel prior to going in. And, and um, the medications you bring in have to be personal medications only for your own personal use. So for the most part, that, I mean, to be fair, the amount of aid that could go in with the emergency medical teams was so insufficient to meet even a tiny fraction of the needs of the people in Gaza to begin with. But even that small window has been closed. Thank you. Um, we have a question here, it kind of ties into that a little bit, but what are the barriers to getting uh, number one, medical aid into Gaza? And number two, providing clean spaces to treat people. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the biggest barrier barrier is the Israelis, the Israeli government, and the Israeli uh, occupation forces. I mean, that's that's the key um, barrier. Um, I mean, um, although although uh, there, I mean, when, when those of us, many of us who went to Gaza, healthcare workers. You know, we all commented, posted pictures and videos online for you know these these aid trucks lined up 
you know, for for miles on, uh, you know, I, I drove uh, I drove uh, towards the Rafah border for about 25 minutes at about 80 kilometers an hour and the trucks were trucks were lined up. So it shows you how, how far they're lined up and, and just not getting in. And that was a complex uh, situation between, you know, the Egyptian government, the Israeli uh, government and and um, and so that was a complex scenario. Having said that, at the border to the Egyptian customs uh, credit, they did let us take a lot of things. And as Ben said, I, I took seven, eight suitcases with me. Uh, others took seven, eight suitcases. A team of ten—that's eighty suitcases of everything, supplies, and even things like coffee and chocolates and whatever, right? Other things. Um, so, but now, of course, uh, that's the biggest barrier. Number one. Um, Stuff can still get in, and I'm sure you guys know this. I mean, there's there's uh, there's organizations in Jordan that have some have some ability to get some things in, heavy equipment, so a bigger equipment in uh, that can happen. And there are those channels present, so there are some indirect channels present, uh, but it's just so difficult. Um, the second question was on the ground. I mean, one of the shortages in the hospitals um, or makeshift hospitals is maybe one or two that have been able to open up is beds. Right. Uh, people have taken the beds away. I mean, even when we were there, when I was at the European Gaza Hospital in March, uh, between December and March, uh, the beds had gone because people had taken people uh, about 25,000 people were living at that point in time around the hospital in these makeshift tents. They took the hospital beds to sleep on because they had no beds. So the hospital had no beds. So you're treating people on the ground, you're suturing people on the ground. And then uh, eventually, the European Gaza Hospital started having sewage leaks because of volume. Uh, it's not designed for 25, 30,000 people living there. Uh, it's designed, it's a 250 bed hospital. So, um, you know, beds and, and, and just tents, um, it's hard to get tents in there. And it has been for a long time. They're expensive, number one. So people can't buy, I mean, I mean people were selling them about three months ago. I don't know how it is now, four months ago for 800 US dollars for a tent, right? So shelter uh, is a problem. You have people... 10, 12, 13, 14 people living in one tent because you can't afford your own tent. And getting tents in is an issue as well, right? So yeah, there's. Uh, I think that was your second question, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Dr. Ben, anything to add to that or? No, that's that's spot on. It's absolutely right, yeah, yeah. Um, you have a question, perhaps maybe for Sister Ebtokhad, because I know you're in, you're in Egypt. <clears throat> um. You know, uh, what support is offered to those injured uh, Palestinians who managed to get to Egypt for treatment? And are they still there? So uh, whoever evacuated, they are outside of Gaza. Like no one is allowed to go back to, uh, to Gaza as of now. And uh, these children are still in Gaza or in Egypt or uh, some of them were moved to uh, EU or UAE and a few are in Jordan. Um, so uh, the, if their cases were, as I mentioned, uh, stabilized at the public hospital, that was it. Now what we are doing, we are following up on their treatment and uh, provided them with uh, other resources so they can, you know, uh, have sort of normal life. That's what we are going to try, what, what we are trying to do while we are just, you know, uh, navigating the system to see uh, what is the what is in the future for them. So they are still in Egypt and they are still receiving the treatment and our services. Thank you. Um, I have this question. Um, how did it feel, um, Dr. Ben and, and Dr. Yasser, leaving Gaza on your last trip? Like how, how like could you describe the emotions? Dr. Ben or Dr. Yasser, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, both times, but uh, uh, it was almost like um, like um, uh, survivor's guilt, you know, um, at first. And I think we've all experienced a bit of that. Um, I did, certainly. And, you know, it was because, you know, they're so kind and, and, and generous. Um, and, um, you know, we're the ones that get to leave uh, because you knew the war is getting worse. I mean, you're optimistic and they're optimistic as well. Strong faith in Allah, strong faith in God, a strong faith in and 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 many of them uh, hope uh, that this will that there'll be better days ahead. Uh, that was amazing, um, and that made us feel better actually. But yeah, I mean, it was it was tough leaving because um, of survival school, and you wanted to go back. 
And and I think we all had uh, when we came back, and we still have a desire to go back uh, if we can. And they say that about Gaza. It's a very special, uh, you have to go there to really experience uh, the people and the land. Uh, it's a blessed land. And and people have uh, always say, you know what, and Ben, Ben's gone back many times for even before the uh, genocide started, um, you know, that it draws you back. Um, you know, once you've been to Gaza, you're not the same again. It it, it draws you back because, and, and that's because of the people and the land. It's a blessed land and it's a blessed people. Um, and that's why, despite all the trauma, I think that what what what's helps me sleep a bit better at night um, and um, helps me take a bit more of this trauma that's constantly going on. I think Ben will say the same thing. Once you've been there, you actually can accept the trauma a bit better um, is uh, is that they will be victorious, right? They have that hope. And, and I really think people like that will not be defeated ever. Um, and you have to really go there to really, really um, appreciate that, you know? And and so I think that makes... And so, uh, and I'll let Ben speak. I'll, I'll just say one thing. I mean, the people, people uh, you know, um, said this, well, how can that... I mean, when you went there, being amongst the people, listening to them, not everybody, of course, people are burnt out. There's a lot of trauma. This is... Again, six months ago, okay, uh, people, you know, there was a certain amount of peace amongst those people, uh, amongst Palestinians, doctors and healthcare workers I worked with. Um, even at nighttime, at, at 11 o'clock after they worked all day, seeing the worst things, there was a bit of peace and tranquility. And I think when we came back, we were motivated to advocate more for them. We actually felt better. It was almost therapeutic in, in many ways that we went and were with them and came back. Yeah. Anyways, I'll stop. I'll, I'll let Ben talk. But those are my thoughts. And, and you know, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I I agree that my first feeling when I got on the plane to fly back to, to Canada was was guilt. Um, recognizing how fortunate I was that I could actually leave Gaza for one and I could get on a plane and decide if and when I come back. Like that's a that's that's a good fortune that no one in Gaza has. Um, you know, and I and I think. I think we need to talk a little bit about resistance as a concept, but also how it's actually playing out. Um, you know, it's something that I envisioned, like I, I saw, you know, Yasser and I both saw, and I think Yasser, you'll remember Talat. Talat was a um, one of the hospital directors who was working in a hospital in the central part of Gaza. Um, which was just, you know, targeted, destroyed. He had to leave. He and his family were displaced southwards. Um, and while he was in Rafa, his wife and three of his four children were killed while he was at work. Um, this is while he and his family were living in a tent. Uh, he was at work. It just so happened one of his sons wasn't in the tent at the time. And he and his son ended up living in the office of another hospital director who happened to be in a hospital where, where, you know, we were staying. Um, and, you know, we actually went to the location where Talat's family was buried and it's in a, it's in a cemetery that didn't exist in September, 2023. It's been completely newly created as a result of the massive number of civilian casualties, um, and, you know, it's it's grotesque to actually be present in that cemetery, knowing how massive it is and knowing that it's all new, knowing that some of the graves were three, maybe even four children in a grave. And one of those graves was actually Talat's three children. Three of his children were in one of those graves. Um, and, you know, talking talking to him, really asking, how do you cope? How do you, like... How do you wake up in the morning? How do you deal with this, right? You know, um, the question we never we never should ask, how are you? Like, it's such a simple question that's in the day-to-day -day of every Canadian. We ask it almost, you know, realizing it. And I had to stop asking in Gaza, right? Because um, I asked it as a formality, but the answer is no one wants to answer that question there. But yet Talat told me something that really resonated with me. He said, um, and it actually helped me when I left. Um, so the day that his children were killed, the next day, he went to work, right? And he told me that, and my initial response 
inside, like hearing that was like, I wouldn't be able to do that. That's almost insensitive that he would do that. Like, what was he thinking? Right. And that's, that was totally the wrong reaction. So when I asked him, I said, like, you went to work the day after your family was killed. Like, how did you do that? And he said, this is my form of resistance. Right. If I don't go to work, I'm not serving my people. This is how I serve my people. This is my form of resistance. Right. And recognizing that coming home again, it like it, it really resonated with me. Like, what am I doing right now to support that level of commitment to their own people that you wouldn't even take a day off your family's killed just so you can serve your own people? Like to me, that really resonated with me, realizing that there's like I'm I, I was humbled by it, realizing that I, I you know, that level of resilience, that level of determination, commitment, whatever you want to call it is just I don't think we see that in North America. Um, so when I came back, yeah, I did have survivor's guilt. You know, to be honest, the first time I came back from Gaza in 2013, um, it was different from any other humanitarian zone I was in. I would honestly admit I, I probably was. If if I was screened for depression, I probably would have screened positive for a couple months after coming back. Um, and whatever I saw in 2013 was 100 times worse now. Um, and yet now I think it, it motivates me to action rather than, you know, anything else. And that's purely just witnessing how people in Gaza have responded. Every time they've been asked, they've demonstrated their humanity over and over and over and over again. No matter how many times they're asked, no matter how big the challenge, they've always demonstrated it. Thank you, Dr. Ben. That was, that was very powerful. Um, thank you for sharing those words and, you know, um, I agree as well, the resilience, uh, the strength, the conviction um, that the Palestinians have is really unmatched. And there's a lot of people in the chat and on the questions asking, you know, how can we volunteer? How can we help? Um, you know, we'll share some information in the chat in terms of how uh, you can get involved with HCI. We do have some volunteers right now in Jordan who are packing trucks. Uh, so there are some programs that we offer and, and other charities also offer. So we'll share some information in the chat. Uh, we only have time for one more question out of respect for our speaker's time. Um, and maybe, you know, this is maybe a question for all three um, of, our, of our speakers. How um, how do you envision merging or pooling up all the efforts once a ceasefire is achieved to help rebuild Gaza? Uh, anybody wants to Sorry, what was the question? How do you envision merging or pooling up all the efforts once a ceasefire is achieved to help rebuild Gaza? We, uh, uh, how are we going to pool the resources? Sorry. Yeah, so I guess combining all the efforts from a humanitarian perspective, from a political perspective, from a medical perspective. How do you, you know, come together? Like, how do we? How do you come together to to rebuild essentially? Well, I think you know. Uh, uh... We're beyond ceasefire. Um, first of all, the Israeli government never uh, doesn't want and never wanted a ceasefire. So I think we're beyond ceasefire. I think we're uh, in in my in in my in my opinion, the the next thing is 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 an end to the occupation. The occupation has to end. Forget the ceasefire. Um, but having said that, um, I I I I think that um, like I had mentioned before, you know, uh, I I think uh, first and foremost, uh, I think. The uh, NGO and the NGOs with uh, with strong support systems in uh, in in Gaza and um, and in that area have to come have to come together, basically, right? Um, have to come together um, and um, and and work with the government and go in because you know honestly it's 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 going to be a long time, right? And I I, I think I think I think um, I don't see a ceasefire happening without some kind of end to the occupation or some kind of modified end, which means that uh, until that time happens, um, I think the NGOs have to come together along with the Canadian government. Um, the issue is that if if an unfriendly Canadian government comes in next year, right, um, that'll be a big, big challenge for you guys at all. So, yeah. And the other thing that I mean, I, I'm sure you guys have, have addressed this is um, um, is you know you know the the countries that surround uh, Palestine and uh, Gaza 
um, you know, like Jordan and uh, Egypt. And I mean, I, I, I would say Lebanon, but, but, but Lebanon is not in any kind of condition now. And even Syria, there are local uh, organizations also, right, uh, that have access into Gaza and the West Bank. And so working with them as well in a coordinated effort, which I know you are now, but actually in an increased effort, the whole region is going to have to come together. Yeah. But it's a really, it's a non-specific, it's a really hard question to answer because it's so changing, but we have to be ready for that. You guys have to be ready for that, right? The volunteers have to be ready for that, that when the call comes to really be uh, uh, even more activated than we are now. Maybe. Um, I don't know, Ben, if you can clarify that answer a bit more. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really important question. And it's one yeah. I think that in the humanitarian sector we've struggled with, right? Like the, the two areas that I find particularly challenging, I come from a, I'm, I'm a physician, I've done research, I've done graduate work and published papers. And so from my perspective, I like to know that what I'm doing has an impact and that there's some evidence behind what we're doing, right? And the humanitarian sector has really only just within the last 10 years started to take a, an approach looking at, you know, what is the evidence behind what we're doing? You know, should we be giving vouchers or cash? Should we be doing... You know, simple questions are, uh, we're only now getting to a point where we're doing research and answering those. So that that's a struggle. The second issue is that um, humanitarian sector has chronically been siloed, right? So you have, you know, this group does water and sanitation. This group does food. This group does emergency medical care. This group is going to build a hospital, this, you know, so it's very um, uh, lacking in coordination, right? And especially for a complex humanitarian emergency, like what's happening in Gaza, you have the humanitarian side, which is really what's, uh, what, you know, we, we think about when we have a humanitarian disaster is doctors going in and providing help, you know, people going in and digging water wells, you know, providing water, uh, providing food, that's really a very temporary and non-sustainable measure, right? As soon as the, as soon as whatever that threat is, whether it's conflict, whether it's a weather event, as soon as that's over, the development is needed, right? Except in Gaza, there's an additional level, which is it's not only you need at the beginning to start thinking about the development piece as well as the humanitarian piece, but also you can't do that um, outside of the political context. You cannot build development programs and humanitarian programs longitudinally and think it's gonna be sustainable in a, like, we'll still do it. It still needs to be done now, but um, it's a lot easier to do that in the context of a community that you know is not gonna be bombed again in a year. Right? And I say this, you know, one of the projects that I was involved in in 2015, um, a colleague of mine and I were quite struck by the fact that hospitals would often have power outages. And even in the middle of, you know, resetting someone's broken bone um, or, you know, doing a surgery, for example, the lights in the hospital would go off, right? And so the physicians would pull out their cell phones to light whatever area you were doing. And so we said, you know, if there's anything in Gaza, there's sun. We should set up some solar power systems in the hospitals. And we did that. And of course, you know, as a humanitarian project, as a development project, we would argue it's a success. But the one thing that we were um, criticized of quite rightfully was what's going to happen when those are bombed? Well, my answer is, well, we'll do it again. Right. But imagine how wonderful it would be if we didn't have to do it again. Right. Imagine if you had a political context where you weren't having Israel bombing hospitals every two or three years, knowing that the four hospitals that we set up with solar energy systems now don't have solar energy systems because they don't exist, right? Imagine how much easier it would be to provide long-term sustainable development in that context, right? And that's the piece that I think in Gaza is particularly complicated and, and, and needs, needs to be considered in the context of not having apartheid, not having occupation, not having a genocide. 
Um, and that's something it's uncomfortable because as a humanitarian, we're taught, you know, I have to be neutral. I have to be independent. I have to think about humanity and all these principles that mean I'm not supposed to talk about genocide. I'm not supposed to mention that word. I'm not, but, but the reality is you realize that the work we're doing is just not as effective unless you're willing to take on those roles. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ben. Um, if the heart, I want to give you perhaps a chance to, to answer this as well. Of course, at HCI, we believe from crisis to sustainability, and you have led, um, you know, uh, the program team here at HCI through many different emergencies. So any thoughts or reflections on, on this question? So uh, both Dr. Ben and uh, Dr. Yasser actually, you know, uh, touch uh, the core of this, uh, that uh, it's like it's the, the end of the occupation, the apartheid system in Gaza that actually can have that sustainability development for any work that we do. Uh, we build hospitals, then it's bombed in, in a year or two. And uh, But the most important part also is that for the organizations and the governments to have more of a collaborative approach. And that actually with this crisis, that's what we have been doing because HCI on its own cannot, you know, and won't be able to implement larger projects with uh, bigger and uh, a bigger impact on the lives of the people. So we have been actually, you know, just bringing organizations together and collaboratively doing the, the work either in Gaza, in Egypt, in Turkey, or here in, in Canada. And that's how we need to move, you know, uh, forward, that we believe in the cause, we are the humanitarian sector, we should you know, uh, focus on uh, helping, supporting the people that we serve. And I hate the word beneficiaries for the fact that any one of us can find themselves in their shoes. And I'm just going to give a small example how, you know, when you have even uh, like um, an area where there is armed conflict, but there are certain areas that are, you know, under uh, sovereignty of another country, which is the northern part of Syria, we just uh, opened our first village. And that's the sustainable approach, you know, that's where you are creating a community, you are providing people with dignified shelter, you're providing their kids with education, you're providing them with access to health services, you know, you're creating the community by providing community hub, which is the masjid. So that's what we are looking into once the occupation ends in, uh, in Palestine, inshallah. I'm hopeful, it's not only Gaza, in Palestine in total, in general. Thank you, Iftikhar. Um, so that brings us to uh, a conclusion. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for your time. I know it's a Thursday evening. Um, you probably finished work and you hopped on this webinar. And so I hope that this was useful and, and helpful in understanding um, the context and also the current situation on the ground in Gaza. Um, we do hope to hold similar webinars in the future, inshallah, God willing, uh, to shed some lights on other areas as well in Gaza and in other regions. Um, so please follow us on social media to, to stay uh, you know, up to date on that. Um, I think a personal takeaway for me, if I could, you know, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of takeaways, but I think um, one main thing that I'm taking away is asking myself every day, you know, what can I do today? Um, and I think, you know, I think everyone on this webinar, I, I would encourage you to also ask yourselves that question. Um, of course, some of us have, you know, money to donate. Perhaps that's one way we can help. Perhaps we have connections or we're, you know, a good um, speaker and we can do some advocacy or lobbying, you know, calling your MPs, uh, whatnot. Uh, perhaps we have time. Perhaps we can get you to volunteer uh, our skills. Um, of course, in the situation for Dr. Yasser and Dr. Ben, they are professionals. They're able to, to be more hands-on. But you know, we all have some expertise we can contribute. So what is that and, and how can you tap into it um, to help? Um, if you don't have money or time, you know, uh, your dua, your prayer, of course, is very, very important and probably the most important thing that uh, that we can do. Um, and so thank you again for your time. Um, it was a pleasure. And I would like to thank also, of course, our guests for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be with us here today to, um, of course, provide, provide us with their insights and also answer our questions. Uh, my name is Mukmin, and on behalf of HCI, thank you and assalamu alaikum. <laughs>